So, as you know, um, today we're going to be talking about mineral accretion technology. And this is something that is very near and dear to my heart. Um, but it's also one of the major tools that we have on our belt as coral restorationists that we should all be utilizing in certain situations um, as, it be, as it is applicable. Um, and unfortunately, it's, it's, you know, even though it's been around for a long time, it's not being utilized to the extent that it could be, um, which is unfortunate, which is why we want to have these types of webinars and try to get this information out there. And we'll talk about why it's not being used as much um, in a little bit. But the first thing I wanted to talk about, um, just the kind of the outline. Um, so today we're going to talk about what is mineral accretion technology. We'll go through a bit about why do we need it, um, what it can do, how is it used, and just the basics of how it works. And just to kind of give you a bit of backstory on, you know, who I am and, and, and why I'm doing this. Um, I started off working with mineral accretion devices back in 2006. This was a pilot bio rock structure on the island of Koh Tao um, in, the, in the Bay of Ta Cha. Um, and it's, it's a bay that died in 1998. And it was, the, as you can see in that photo on the left there, there's nothing really growing in this area. And that was pretty much the, the way that that entire bay was and still is. Um, even today, we have less than 5% coral coverage in that bay. Whereas prior to 1998, it was incredible coverage of branching coral, but unfortunately they all died and now it's just rubble. So we had this bio rock project. And at that time, like I didn't know anything about coral restoration and, and I was just coming from the mountains. But the first time I saw that bio rock covered in corals, beautiful, beautiful corals. And I didn't have to tell anyone like, hey, this works. And no one had to tell me, all you had to do was stick your head in the water. I mean, you saw that the entire bay was dead, except this one strip where we had this mineral accretion device. Um, and it was just full of these beautiful, vibrant corals. So I came back and started my program there on the island. And in 2008, I was put in charge of the marine branch of the local community group there, Safe Hotel. So when we had to do our first project, it was a no brainer that we wanted to do something with mineral accretion. And so we created the first alternative dive site on the island back in 2008. It's called Hinfi. We had 18 of the local schools, uh, dive schools on the island helping us to build that. And it was a very successful project in some ways. Um, and so I've been maintaining that for many years. Um, that was built with BioRock Company. Um, we'll get into more of that later. And then more recently, I started working with a business partner of mine, a friend and colleague named Bob Savenster who has an organization called Coralate. And so what he's trying to do is really take this mineral accretion technology um, into the 21st century with you know, computerized transformers and, and all this that we'll get into soon. And um, so I just wanna real quick, you know, sh give a shout out to Coralate, to Bob. Um, if, if you guys have it, if you're on Facebook and have a chance, maybe uh, head over and check out Coralate give them a, a like and you can follow along with what he's doing over there. All right, so before I get really into what are mineral accretion devices, I wanna kind of just set the stage about why do we need them? Um, like many of our coral restoration techniques, you know, they, there's a whole consortium of threats to coral reefs. Um, we can see the direct threats, the localized threats from, you know, wastewater and diving and overfishing and, and habitat destruction and all these things. Uh, but when we talk about the mineral accretion, what we want to more focus on, it does help with some of those things. But what we want to focus on are the global threats. So we're going to talk a bit more about things like climate change and coral bleaching. And as you can see in this photo, coral bleaching is a very significant problem for reefs around the world. Um, in the photo on the left um, is Chilok Ban Khao in, on, in Thailand, and we can see beautiful corals. Um, and then in the summer of 2014, all those corals went white. And if we go to the next slide here, you'll see, unfortunately, most of those corals didn't make it. And so today, what we have is a dead reef. And this is a direct result of climate change. And we're going to talk a little about coral bleaching. So hopefully you guys are all you know, because you're here, kind of um, familiar with, with corals and, and how the holobion, 
um, is, you know, the coral tissue, the animal it is a jellyfish like organism that has an exoskeleton that that we see as that solid kind of limestone coral. Um, and that coral tissue is full of these unicellular algae called zooxanthellae. So when we have a healthy holobion, we have the coral tissue um, on top of its skeleton and it's full of these zooxanthellae. They're providing 70 to 90% of the coral's metabolic energy input, taking energy from the sun, converting it into sugars and, and lipo lipids and giving that to the coral. And that's where it gets most of its energy. But if water conditions change uh, with thermal bleaching when they warm up, then that mutualistic symbiosis starts to break down. The coral starts to become an uninhabitable, uninhabitable environment for the zooxanthellae. And the zooxanthellae start producing more free radicals like hydrogen peroxide that attacks the coral. So they'll become in competition with each other and the coral usually wins out by expelling or digesting the zooxanthellae. But now the coral is left in a state where it doesn't get 70 to 80% of its metabolic daily input of energy. Um, it's also much more susceptible to threats. It's stressed out. It's going to you know, be likely to get diseased or, or can't produce mucus to slough off sediment and these kind of things. So we end up with dead coral um, and that eventually gets covered over in filamentous algae. So that's what coral bleaching is. Um, to give you a little history of it now. So coral bleaching um, is a natural phenomenon, of course. Um, it's always happened to some degree on the coral reefs. If we look at you know, the, the early history, we look into the scientific literature, we can find isolated reports of coral bleaching between 1900 and 1979. But generally these are in like tide pools or there's a couple of corals um, you know, of, of, of a single species that go at you know, the lowest tide of the year or something like that. But in 1979, 1980, we have the first report um, of what was known as mass coral bleaching. So rather than just one species of coral or a couple of corals in the tidal pool, this was a lot of different species of corals across a wide range of the reef. So this we termed as a mass coral bleaching event. And that was the first one in 1979, 1980. That was on the Great Barrier Reef. Then only a short time later in 1998, we had the first global mass coral bleaching event. So this was not just you know, multiple species across a wide swath of reef. This was reefs all around the world bleaching. And in 1998, we lost 16% of the world's hard corals. That's a lot, you know, that's a, almost a fifth of our corals went away in a single year. And most people have never even heard of that. I mean, if I think if it was the rainforest that disappeared 16% in a single year, we would all know about it. We would all be very concerned about it. Um, but, you know, it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. Most people don't even know what coral bleaching is. So it's kind of hard to explain to them that, you know, they should be concerned about it. So we look forward, 2002 was a bad year, 2004 was a bad year for many reefs, 2006, another mass bleaching year. And then 2010, we had another global event. And then it didn't take long before 2014 and 17, we had a three year mass coral bleaching event, the first of its kind. By the end of that, 50% um, of the Great Barrier Reef was gone. I think it was actually about 20 to 30% in that time period but it led up to the 50% that we now report today for the Great Barrier Reef. So bleaching incidents are natural. However, mass coral bleaching and global mass coral bleaching events, we don't think are that, nat are that natural or they shouldn't be so frequent. What we're seeing is that an increase in both the frequency and severity of these events. And this combined with all the other human related problems, um, habitat destruction, declining water quality, and everything else is leading to major issues with our global coral population. But it's not the only problem, of course. Um, the other problem that comes about with climate change in addition to warming oceans is more acidic oceans. So the pH of the oceans is actually going down. And this happens for several reasons, but the main one is that we get more CO2 dissolving into the ocean water. Um, the oceans are our largest sink of CO2 globally. Something like 22 million tons of CO2 enters into our oceans every year. 
And so if it wasn't for our oceans, you know, when we think about the industrial revolution and all the pollution we put into the atmosphere, um, it doesn't stay in the atmosphere. If it did, we'd look like Venus right now. Most of that does go back into the oceans and there it forms carbonic acid. Um, so let's talk about ocean acidification a bit. So when we have like a glass of water and it's sitting on a table, it'll tend to be in equilibrium with the air as far as its gas can, content goes. So it, it'll be like 21% oxygen and, and all that within it. However, water absorbs CO2 much faster than it absorbs oxygen. Also, warmer water can hold less oxygen and more CO2. So when ocean waters warm up, they can hold more CO2. But we're also putting more CO2 into the atmosphere. So these two effects compound. And as we put these you know, acids, the carbonic acid from carbon dioxide into the, into the oceans, that is going to affect the the buffering of the water and it's going to deplete the amount of carbonate salts that we have. So it's basically a, an acid base reaction. Hopefully you guys are all familiar with these kind of like one of the more simple reactions we have in chemistry. So we can actually see this how this works in our oceans. We have this balance between the bases which we would call aragonite, these alkaline minerals, calcium carbonate, the things like limestone and the things that um, corals make their skeleton out of. And we can see how that concentrations are affected based on the atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide. At the moment, um, so we look at the first one, like 280 is the parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. That was pre-industrial revolution. Um, and so we can see this big blue area. That's where we get aragonite depositing. So it, it's in such high abundance concentrations that it can actually deposit. And if we look at that map, we understand that's where a lot of the world's coral reefs are. Um, and also like oyster reefs and things like that. But now today we're at 415 parts per million of carbon dioxide. Once we start increasing um, the concentration of carbon dioxide, it reduces the amount of the alkaline minerals like aragonite that can form. And so as we look at those graphs, we see less and less of the blue areas and much more of the yellow and red areas where we're getting not into the deposition of limestone, um, but the dissolution of it. And a lot of the times people ask, well, yeah, but doesn't ocean pH change all the time? Um, and, and yes, to some degree it does. But if we look back, you know, 25 million years, we find that it's always between the range of 8 and 8.3. So the ocean waters are alkaline. And if we were to extend this graph back even further, we would still find that the ocean waters are alkaline. And that's why we find today that most of our organisms like corals, sponges, mollusks, they all build their skeletons and their, their structure out of alkaline minerals because those are what are abundant in the water to utilize. So that's how corals make their skeleton, how a, sh how a snail makes its shell is using these alkaline minerals, right? Um, but when we look at what's going on today, um, we can see that that pH is going to drop very, very quickly. It already is dropping quickly and it looks, you know, it, it's, it's unprecedented to see this kind of change in our Earth's um, oceans and, and atmosphere. So this affects the living corals, um, but it also primarily affects corals and other organisms when they're in their most vulnerable stage, which is their larval stage. Um, you know, corals, they're not taken care of by their parents like we, like we do or elephants or other higher order animals. They have our strategy reproduction, which means they put out tons of eggs and sperm and let them do their own thing, let them survive on their own. So they're given some lipids, like an egg, you know, it's, it's full of these fats and nutrients. And that's what the juvenile lives off of for a very long time. And it's, it's early life stage. Well, what we find is when oceans are more acidic, when waters are more acidic, um, as in this graph here from Albright, in some experiments she did with coral larvae, when we increase the amount of CO2 in the water, much less of these coral larvae are able to make it to the metamorphous stage to settle down. And those that do settle down are much less likely to survive. So even with settlement, um, once they do settle down, they have to put down that first base layer of calcium carbonate to glue them to the surface and start to create their skeleton. 
And if they're in acidic, more acidic waters, then that becomes a lot more of an energy investment to do so. And so much fewer, many fewer of them would be able to do that. Um, so when ocean waters change in their CO2 concentration by just a you know, relatively small amount, we see that we get decreased larval survival, settlement, metabolism, and growth. Um, so not only are we losing, you know, through a coral bleaching, the adult corals, the, the ones that who are building the reef and providing the habitat for all the organisms that live there, but we also lose the, the ability to replace them if they die from like a bleaching event. So, and I promise I don't have too much more depressing stuff to go through. <laughs> but um, so here's some, some pictures from the USGS that I just want to use because I think they really illustrate this point. This is from the Caribbean. So this is in 1970s. This is a bunch of Acropora coral in the Caribbean. Um, what they call like staghorn and elkhorn coral. And then here is a large parietes coral. And we can see that, you know, there's very good coverage. Um, but what happened in this area in the 1970s was an outbreak of a coral disease. And so what happened by the 1980s, that coral disease primarily affected the Acropora. So now we see that Acropora is gone. And we also in the 80s had a disease in the Caribbean that wiped out a lot of the diaderma, the sea urchins. So there's no sea urchins to consume a lot of the algae. So that algae starts to take over the reef. Um, and once that algae covers over all this coral rubble, it's very hard for new larvae to come and settle down here and be successful. Luckily, our, our parietes is still there. But here's what I want you to do. So we lost our coral from the disease, but now you see all of this dead coral here. Let's look at what happens in another 10 years. Boom. So all that dead coral's gone. Right, we've got sand patches now, and it, it looks deeper. I don't know if that's because of the tide. Um, it could be. Um, it's hard to know with photographs, but it could also be that you know a lot of this is just dissolving. It's it's being broken down mechanically and also chemically, and we see a lot more macroalgae around here. Um, and our our parietes coral has also gotten away by this time. And once we get to this stage, you know. It, if you were a coral polyp coming to settle here, there's a lot of competition from fast growing algae. There's not much clean substrate to settle on. And there's not even that much stable substrate to settle on. So we can jump forward another 10 years. It's no longer a coral reef ecosystem that we have there. So I, I, I wish I could tell you this was an isolated incident, that this was something that only happened in this series of photographs, but unfortunately, this is the Caribbean. Um, the Caribbean, 90% of the corals of the Caribbean have been lost already. All right, so I hope now I've gone through all the bad news stuff <laughs> and, and started off depressing you guys uh, if you're in America early in the morning here. Um, but now I wanna move to the good news. So we, we, you know, I'm not gonna tell you all these things and then not tell you about solutions. So let's go on to the solutions. This is where we actually get to our mineral accretion devices. So what is a mineral accretion device? Um, in our case, you know, when we're talking about reef restoration, it's purpose-built structures. So it's artificial reefs um, in seawater, but electrified using low voltage electrical current. Now this induces electrolysis leading to the mineral accretion. Um, so we're gonna look more at, in detail about this, but just to give you some other names, uh, mineral accretion is like the technical term it's also been called um, other names like biorock, secrete, and cement. And when I say secrete and cement, I meant S-E-A, crete. So C like the ocean. It's basically when we take electrolysis um, is, is not specific to this technology only. We, we find electrolysis in a lot of places. Um, it's essentially a way to make chemical reactions happen that wouldn't happen on their own. So by putting electricity, we can make a chemical reaction happen. We'll go through these chemical reactions soon. Um, but in this case, we just have like what we would call an anode and a cathode in the ocean water. And when we put electricity through it, um, based on, on several changes that occur, we get minerals actually coming out of the seawater and collecting onto 
that cathode, that metal structure. Um, so these, these uh, if you look here, this white crusty stuff, this is that mineral. And this is coming right out of the seawater. So, um, and just collects and builds up on here as the electricity is throwing, flowing. Now, electrolysis has many other uses. We might use it to coat metals. We might use it to produce um, hydrogen gas or chlorine gas or other types of gases from water. Um, in Singapore, they're using it uh, currently to mang uh, mine magnesium out of the seawater because of course they don't have any uh, mines on land in Singapore. Um, so there's many uses of it. It's not specific to this. So I'm going to talk about it in relation to coral restoration. So uh, again, remember this is also, we'll talk more, but also often called like bio rock or other names. So it's a form of active coral restoration. So we're actually going and putting our time, our energy, and our money and resources into speeding up or, or you know, altering the path of the redevelopment of the coral reef after a disturbance. It provides artificial structure, like our other artificial reef um, designs that we might have that are made out of steel or glass or concrete or things like that. It provides a stable area for corals to grow in areas like in the photographs I showed you that were all branching corals that then died. Those branching corals are not a good place for coral to settle. They don't provide stability. That rubble moves around in waves and storms. And so we are able to just provide structure, corals can grow in some areas. But it goes beyond our other artificial reefs in that this actually alters the water chemistry. It allows corals to redirect their, their internal energy to other tasks by making the skeletal growth easier. Now, I wanna give a little history about this before I get into how it works. Um, so this, this technology um, was invented by Professor Wolf Hilberts back in the 1970s. Um, you can see this patent from 1980. Um, so mineral accretion of large services. He was actually an architect. And so his idea was to start to create building materials from the ocean. So rather than use you know, Portland cement and be constricted to a lot of size um, requirements and also contributing heavily to you know, climate change and global warming, we could put down structures of any shape um, and then put them into the ocean, let them sit there for a while and bring them up. And we would have a, a material that was actually three times harder than Portland cement. Um, and it wouldn't really take, you know, the, 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 the energy input that it requires to create concrete. He had gotten this idea after looking at the way that, you know, shells grow and wanting to build like, you know, a lot of really um, futuristic type architecture from that. But as the, uh, the myths go, I don't know how much truth there is to this, um, but the old story kind of goes that as he was trying to grow these building materials under the ocean, um, they were constantly being covered over in, in oysters and clams and all these other organisms that he was trying to, you know, they were fouling organisms, so he didn't want them there. Um, and eventually, you know, he realized that they were growing so well, and it's one of those like, if you can't beat them, join them kind of things. And so he eventually started to look out for um, coral reef scientists to help him turn this into a way to grow corals and other organisms. So in 1996, we get another patent, um, a method of enhancing the growth of aquatic organisms and structure um, through this mineral accretion device um, with Professor Wolf Hilberts and Dr. Thomas Guerrero. And this is, is the patent for what we now know as BioRock, that trademark name. So what are the benefits? So according to a lot of the, the literature out there, uh, you know, I, I should give a disclaimer, a lot of the literature that is out there is written by Dr. Guerrero. And so he is part of the, one of the patent holders. So um, there is a lot more science that needs to be done because you know, as scientists, we don't usually give much credence to work done by someone who has monetary investments and, and, and gains uh, you know, in, other interests in, in the technology. Um, but according to his um, work, it, anywhere from three to six times faster growth of corals not only corals, but you know, other organisms that utilize calcium carbonate. So 
um, sponges on this. This is our, our structure now. Look, you can see there's a lot of soft corals doing quite well on here. But we also have a giant clam that's doing just incredible on here. Um, so it's been used for corals, for oysters, for all kinds of aquatic organisms. And generally we see between three and six times faster growth. They're also stronger. They're more robust. So we can get them to grow in a wider range of environmental conditions. So we can get corals to grow in water that would normally be too hot or too cold for them to grow. Um, water that is too turbid or, you know, all these different factors. We can get corals to grow in conditions that are not technic, not normally ideal for their growth. We also find they have a higher fecundity or basically a higher reproductive output. So these corals are investing less of their metabolic energy into you know, their daily somatic requirements and growth and tissue repair and their symbioses with their algae. Um, so they have more energy that they can then invest into reproduction. But it's also, it is an artificial reef. So it provides for the habitat for other symbiotic organisms. You know, corals don't grow in isolation. They need the herbivorous fishes and all the other symbiotic organisms of the coral reef that, that create the ecosystem as a whole. So these are some of the benefits of this technology in, in relation to using it for corals. And let's see how people are actually using it. So how can this be used? And I just want to point out one really cool thing here. This is an underwater sculpture made by my colleague, uh, Spencer Arnold. And I just want to point out it's an angler fish and we were able to actually get a light to light up on the end of it with the electricity. That has no benefit to the environment whatsoever. It was just something cool to do. In the beginning, I made you guys sit through that really depressing bit about coral bleaching and climate change. And the reason for that was that one of the ways that I see this mineral accretion technology or biorock technology being most valuable is in terms of protecting coral from bleaching events. This is the data that we had on our HINFI site. And this is by 2010. It's not yet that uh, covered in corals, as you can see in the photograph. We, it's a quite deep site. But what we find, let's look at the, the right side here. Off the site during 2010, during that mass global mass bleaching event, 55% of the corals on the reef were completely white. They had no zooxanthellae left in them. A further 34% were partially bleached, meaning that, you know, like this one here, it's, it's, it's lost most its color, but there's still some zooxanthellae left in there. Given the right conditions, this one would come back very easily. It would recover. But the ones that are white, have much less chance of, of recovering. So, at, and only 10% we were considered healthy on this date. Now we look just on the same day, just about 10 meters over to the side. And what we see here is almost a night and day. Um, only 1% of the corals are fully bleached. About 42% are partially bleached. These are the ones that have lost most of their color, but are likely to come back pretty well because they still have zooxanthellae in them that just needs to propagate outwards. And a total of 56%. So, you know, as much as we had completely white corals on the actual reef, we had healthy corals on our biorock structure on HINFI. And after the bleaching event, these corals came back. So you can see, here's this little uh, Acropora table coral here, completely bleached. Uh, maybe, I don't know if what's going on here, we can see some dark spots, but there's no zooxanthellae left in this coral in 2010 on the side of Hinfi. It was able to survive and come back. In 2014, over here on the top right, it again bleached, came back again, and continued to grow great. So this is Acropora, is the most, was one of the most susceptible coral genre to bleaching. It's uh, one of the genre that many scientists think is going to go extinct because of coral bleaching. And we can show survival, good survival on our structures. And it's not the only one. Um, you know, there's plenty of them that have survived on this structure. So that's one way we can kind of do this. We can, it kind of allows us to create what you'll hear um, from the BioRock company a lot is coral arcs. Um, the idea of like Noah's Ark. So you can get ahead of the storm, build one of these structures, get corals on it, 
and the bleaching is, you know, a non, uh, you know, much like a flood in the case for corals that it wipes out all the, the living stuff. And so you basically have this coral arc down in the water where corals can survive. And then after the bleaching events done, they can start to be produced sexually and reseed the reefs around them. Um, it creates a biodiversity bank and that leads us to its next use is to create these kind of biodiversity banks. And this idea is kind of like they're doing in Sweden or Norway, putting all the seeds from around the world into these big vaults to create these genetic banks for the seeds um, to preserve that genetic material. We can kind of create these living vaults for coral genetic material. And this is in addition to the stuff work being done by NOAA to actually freeze a lot of these coral genetic these coral gametes. But this is like a living place. So you could have this, you know, if, if you're a reef manager in your area and you know that your shallow reefs are very susceptible to humid um, anthropogenic threats and bleaching and all this, you create one of these areas off, off the reef, out in the middle of the sands where there's less human in, intervention, less problems, less issues. Um, and then you can transplant corals there and keep them there as a sort of bank. When you need corals, you can go and grab these ones and put them back, or you can just allow them to reproduce sexually and seed the reefs for, with future generations. So this is one really great way that, it's, that I see this being used that is very different from other coral restoration techniques like artificial reefs and even coral nurseries. To, with coral nurseries, we can do this to some degree, but you know, it's, it's not as effective or efficient. Um, the most we can do with the coral nursery is when a bleaching year occurs, we can lower it down deeper into the water. So it's at deeper depths, cold, cooler water and less light. But this, we don't have to do that. We can just have it electrified and these corals are growing great um, and, and less susceptible to threat. So another major problem around the world is beach erosion. And uh, I just have this photo from Thailand. It's probably not the best photo, but uh, it does demonstrate how in Thailand they tried to protect the beaches. So we can see this tree here. This tree has obviously been here a very long time. Um, the roots were deep into soil and now they're completely exposed because all the soil is going away. And we could also pull out pictures of seeing hotels and, and houses and stuff falling into the ocean. The reason this occurs is that the reef is gone out here. There used to be a nice reef that used to break the waves. Um, now that reef is gone and the waves make it in further. There's, of course, other reasons that going on on land that contribute to this. But a lot of time what they do in Thailand is just put out these bags of sand, plastic bags full of sand. These are good for, I don't know, I have no reason, I have nothing. There's no benefit to these really. They, they might stop this little bit of beach from eroding away, but then this all breaks apart and all this plastic goes into the ocean and it, we just create more problems for ourselves. Uh, another way that people will do this is cover this area in concrete. Like you'll see a lot of shorelines have concrete blocks uh, or they'll put a concrete seawall out here. But of course, concrete's expensive, difficult to build, contributes to climate change, and also it breaks. And so when it breaks, you have to repair it, it doesn't function as well. So the idea with the mineral accretion devices is to actually create living seawalls. So to not do something really artificial, but to just assist with how nature would normally protect our coastlines, which is through living reefs. And with the mineral accretion device, we get corals growing very well on these. We can create breakwaters. If this was to be hit by a storm and the mineral accretion that's growing on here was to break off, this would just regrow back again. So it's self-repairing. And actually one use for mineral accretion is to repair concrete, um, cracked and broken concrete. So this would rather than being putting up plastic bags or, or concrete walls that reduce water quality and don't actually work that well, um, to just simulate what nature does as type of biomimicry um, and you know, kind of assisting, assisting nature rather than going against it. So seawalls, um, wave breaks, shoreline protection is another big way um, that these, these devices have a lot of potential to be utilized around the world. Um, and unfortunately today um, aren't being done so. 
Another one that was just highlighted in a recent publication was the fact that our oceans have a lot of oil and gas structures in them, uh, about 75, uh, 7,500 of them. And most of those, 85%, are going to become obsolete in the next 10 years. They can no longer be used. So there's different methods of disposal. Um, you know, they might be just left, they might be broken down, they might be shipped back and, and taken apart and sold as scrap. But, you know, these areas, they're kind of areas of biodiversity. I mean, if, if you're a scuba diver, you know, when you jump out into the blue, into the open ocean, you'll spend your dive pretty bored um, because you're not going to see too much out there typically. But if there's anything out there, like say a floating raft of debris or any type of object, it's going to just be surrounded by life. And so these oil platforms um, are oases of life. And um, I've worked with some of my colleagues uh, monitor the, the oil platforms around the Gulf of Thailand. And it's just some of the most incredible diving I've ever seen because they are so full of pelagic fishes and whale sharks, and they're just covered in, in all these clams and barnacles. I, I would think it would be better. Um, and that's, you know, the, this paper that came out recently um, proposing that, you know, why don't we just turn these into these little islands of biodiversity? And if the oil and gas companies have been destroying our marine life for so many years, how about we turn this into a good thing and use these structures to help protect marine life? Um, it's going to be hard for a fisherman to get a net in here as well. So it kind of gives them some refuge from all the trawling and, and commercial fishing that's going on in our oceans around the world. So all we'd have to do is instead of investing tons of money into breaking these down is to put solar panels on them and electrify them and we would turn them into mineral accretion devices and they would start to grow these minerals. So the other thing I, I mentioned it already, but is you know the creation of these minerals. Some of these minerals are quite valuable. Uh, I mentioned that um, you know Singapore, they're trying to look at doing this to mine magnesium. Um, so Singapore obviously is a very small nation, but very heavily populated. And so one of the things that they have to do is desalinate ocean water to provide for drinking water. And in the next 30 years, they're looking to become the world's largest, um, you know, the, the center of, of, of desalination. That desalination, when you take out the fresh water from seawater, you're left with a brine. And so a very concentrated saline, saline water. You can take that brine and you can mine the minerals out of it. And we'll talk tomorrow about what minerals are in water, but you know, other than magnesium and, and stuff, there's a lot of trace minerals, uh, even you know, gold and, and uranium and stuff like that. Some some very um, expensive minerals that we can grow on this. So, and and just while I'm here, you know, looking, this is actually this is from Professor Hilberts, some of the mineral accretion work that he did, and you can see in the middle is all just normal um, steel rebar. And then this has been electrified and grown all of this calcium carbonate on here, this aragonite, calcite, and brucite. And uh, these are some other drawings um, from Professor Hilberts. This is from a, I can't remember the year, 1979, I think, magazine from um, Tokyo. And I'll link this as well at the end. But this is um, his drawing, just showing all the different ways that this can be used. And we see a lot of the ways we've we've talked about previously. He's got right here the oil and gas structure. He's got you know coral nurseries, shoreline protection, aquaculture, um, and uh, even like looks like underwater habitats under there, seawalls, all these things that can be utilized, that can be assisted with this technology, and uh, um, and big artificial reefs here I should mention as well. Um, and my favorite is uh, another one. This is from Progressive Architecture all the way back in 1970, um, also from Professor Hilberts, showing these kind of ideas of having underwater cities, which is really my dream for the future. I, I would love to go live under the ocean. Um, and so, you know, all these types of things, you know, we, we, we can see how it can be used today, but there's really no limit to our imagination. You know, 71% of our Earth is covered in ocean. And we know more about the surface of the moon than we do that ocean. Um, and so getting us 
living in there would, would be incredible, I think. Um, and mineral accretion could be a major part of getting us there. So that's just a selection, um, a small selection of how it can be used. Um, and this is why we really need the diversity of people um, in this, not just you know marine biologists and stuff looking at this. We need uh, engineers and architects and, and people from all different backgrounds who can have different ideas about how to use this technology and how to put it to our benefit and our planet's benefit. So now I just want to talk a little bit about more about how does it actually work. So what is electrolysis? Um, what are we talking about with, with this kind of stuff? And as you can see here, this is just a little experimental setup and um, we've got electricity flowing um, going. This is, uh, sorry, this is the cathode here. Electricity is flowing into this and going over to this little anode over here. And we see these bubbles coming off. So basically what it is, is we're putting electricity. So we have a power source like a battery or something like that. And that has a positive and negative end. So we're hooking one up to what we call the cathode and one up to what we call the anode. And let's look at that in a bit more detail. And this is that experimental setup that you saw the video from, um, but it's, it can be done. I, the only reason I show this is it's, it's not a complicated setup. <laughs> um, this is very easy setup, just a little uh, battery charger here connected up to two pieces of metal put into seawater. And we've got this electrolytic cell. So let's look at this electrolytic cell. What's going on here? Um, so when we, when electricity, we have a source of it, it's pumping out negatively charged electrons. So those electrons travel through the cable and into this electrode, which would be negatively charged. It's called the cathode. It has a negative charge. The electrons go through the impurities in the water over to the anode. The anode's pulling. Uh, um, electrons out of the water and putting them back to the source. So we've got this kind of circuit here, this flow of electrons. I mentioned that electrolysis allows chemical reactions to occur which would not otherwise occur. The most fundamental of these is breaking apart H2O. So when we put electricity into water, we have H2O and it breaks apart into the H's and the O's, the hydrogen and the oxygen. Now, because of their polarity, they'll each go to a different side. So at the cathode, what we'll see is bubbles of hydrogen gas coming off. So that H from the H2O becomes hydrogen, which is a diatomic molecule. It always exists as two of them. And so it will bubble out of the water. So we have these little bubbles here. At the anode end, where we have the electrons being pulled out of the water, we have the opposite polarity, positive polarity. And there it will attract oxygen. So we'll see oxygen actually bubbling out of the water. And oxygen, of course, is good for sea life. But there's other things that come out at the anode that's not good for sea life. So it's actually the cathode where we will grow our corals and other organisms. Because of the polarity, this is negative, right? So negative attracts positive. So we can look at which uh, ions, anions, sorry, is in the water, like sodium, calcium, magnesium, they have a positive charge, right? So they will be attracted to the negatively charged electrode or the cathode. So we'll see them migrate that way. Others that have a negative charge will be attracted over to the anode, like chlorine. Um, and chlorine, of course, is a diatomic molecule. So it, it will become chlorine gas, Cl2, and it'll also be bubbled out here. And again, we'll go through like the specifics and then show the reactions and everything tomorrow, but I don't want to overwhelm everyone today. So as this occurs, as we keep getting calcium and magnesium drifting over towards the cathode, the cathode actually becomes a very alkaline environment, right? The opposite of ocean acidification. It becomes so alkaline that alkaline minerals like calcium carbonate or magnesium hydroxide actually start to just fall out of the water. They precipitate out and they collect onto the cathode as a type of accretion, right? So calcium carbonate, can, we can call that ar aragonite or calcite, depending on the mineral structure, um, which is quite solid, quite hard. 
magnesium hydroxide, we tend to call brucite, which is less, um, less, less hard. Um, and so depending on how much, how alkaline this is, how much electricity we have throughout flowing through this, we'll get a different ratio of aragonite or calcite to the brucite, the magnesium hydroxide. So this is that process in a photograph. Um, we have where you can see the dark areas here. We have the steel structure. These bubbles are little bubbles of hydrogen gas that would flow up into the water. There, there have been some people that have, you know, um, said that you could capture this and, and turn, in it, turn another source of profit off of it to pay for things. Um, but so in the ocean, it, it's just too hard to do that. And so nobody that I've ever heard of is doing that. So this hydrogen gas just goes off into the ocean. Um, and then we get these minerals depositing. So this is that aragonite, that calcite, that brucite, depending on the conditions that we have, going to be deposited onto here. And if it's aragonite, then it's basically exact same um, minerals that corals are putting down for their skeleton or giant clams or oysters or sponges or all these other marine organisms. We can see that in this structure. This is a structure made by my colleague Spencer Arnold um, called the, the Last Fight for Life. Um, and so it's a steel rebar structure here, the sculpture. And this is when it was put down. The day it was put down, you see it's just bare metal. And if we were to just leave this like this, um, it would very slowly rust away. But we put the cathodic protection on it, throw electricity through it, and it will no, no longer rust. And if we put enough electricity through it, then we actually get these minerals accreting on here. This is about three or four days later since we put the electricity on. You can see how much it has started to gather these minerals. These minerals will grow anywhere from half a centimeter to about two centimeters per year. Um, again, depending on, on the variables, the environmental conditions, the electricity and that kind of stuff. So the, how does this benefit the corals? Now you'll hear different theories. Um, if, if you look at some of the writings by the BioRock company, um, there's some suspicion that it's actually magnetic and an electrical field that benefit the organism. I can't really um, propose that because it might be, um, I'm not gonna say it's not, but it, I haven't seen the science to back that up. Um, what I have seen the science of it, I'm gonna tell you a bit more um, that I think is, is you know, one of the main ways why this improves the, the growing conditions for these organisms. So when we look, corals, they get most of their energy, again, from the symbiotic zooxanthellae, these little microscopic algae that live inside their tissues, like leaves on a tree, they capture the sunlight and produce um, carbohydrates and sugars and, and good things for the coral. So that's where it gets its energy and it gets some from feeding and absorption, but very, very little. If there's a bleaching event, then it's living off of its reserves, right? It, this would be like us, um, if we were to be starving walking through the desert, we'd be living off of the fat we have on our body. This is like them as well. This is their fat, right? So where does their energy go? So a lot of it goes to the somatic requirements. Somatic requirements is just the daily process is, uh, you know, everything it needs to do to um, feed, to digest, to excrete and, and you know, to, to live. Um, there's also the cost of symbiosis. So symbiosis is not free although they get a lot of sugars and carbohydrates from their zooxanthellae, there's a cost to that. The zooxanthellae produce waste, they have to get rid of the waste, they have to feed the zooxanthellae with nutrients, they have to give the zooxanthellae water, you know, they're, they're basically farmers, so there is a cost there. Um, also tissue growth, of course, um, stress management, the immune system, mucus, antibodies, um, fluorescent proteins, all that kind of stuff. And the one I skipped over is the big one here, calcification. So putting down this skeleton is a big job, right? These corals, these, you know, they're in the same family as jellyfish. They don't have eyes or central nervous system or even a digestive system. Um, yet they're able to produce this material that's structurally similar to concrete. And they've done it so much that, you know, the Great Barrier Rift we can see from space. So it takes a lot of energy 
to do what they're doing. And so calcification is a big part of that. And the way that they do it is kind of, we'll go through the chemistry, but it's very similar to what we just talked about. They're basically taking minerals from the ocean water. They're using their metabolic energy to create very alkaline environments under their tissue here at the barrier between the exoskeleton and their tissue. In that area, they're pulling out hydrogen ions, um, you know, the, the, the thing that makes the ocean acidic. They're pulling it out enough that this deposits on its own. Um, and that takes energy. So if we can make that easier, then they've got a whole bunch more energy for all this other stuff, right? It's like if, if we suddenly gave everyone free rent, right? You don't have to pay your rent anymore. Well, that means you got a whole lot more money for food and, and everything else that you want to make your life better. Um, and in the corals, that includes reproduction and reserves. Reserves is big because reserves allows you to weather the storm. If there's a bleaching event, you want to have a lot of reserves. The reason why Acropora are dying off so quickly around the world is because they invest their energy into growing. If it's in times are good, they grow like weeds. They're the fastest growing coral. They just put all their energy into tissue growth, calcification, let's do this. And then when bleaching events come, they got nothing left. Whereas like a Parietes or a Diploastria coral, they're always putting tons of energy into reserves. When they bleach, they're like, no worries. I'll, I can stay bleached for six months to a year. I got, I got energy, right? So with the, the mineral accretion technology, what we do is we make this easier. And with this is easier, they've got a lot more energy for everything else. And so that's the science, the, the, mo the thing that I've seen the most science for why this works. But again, there's still a lot of debates. You'll hear about, um, you know, the, the actual electricity and magnetic fields and stuff like that helping them. And you'll hear about symbioses and, and you'll hear about, you know, the pH and, and these kind of things um, all helping it. We don't actually, at this point, we haven't quantified, um, you know, what, what is the, the reason why it works and under what percentage. Um, but this is the way that I see the most scientific evidence for why it works. So again, in the ocean, if we're going to do electrolysis, then we're going to grow our corals on this cathode side, the one that's accreting minerals. We mentioned that over here at the anode, we're getting chlorine gas over here um, forming. So nothing will really grow on the anode. And when we look at the anode, it looks like a perfectly clean piece of metal that someone just put into the ocean yesterday. It's shiny and bright, there's no corrosion. Um, and we've had um, some times where like our, our unit's been off for an extended period of time, so no electricity flowing through it. And then a lot of little fishes and organisms come and live on the anode during that time because it is you know, a, a stable environment. And then we turn the electricity back on and we have seen mortality of those organisms quite quickly. So you won't find anything growing at the anode. So although it is providing a bit of oxygen, it's not a benefit to the ocean. So we'll usually put the anode far away and above in the water so that the currents will take all that chlorine gas away um, and it will not affect the reef. And then we only get at the reef level, the benefits of the cathode. All right. I just want to mention real quick, what kind of electricity do we need? Um, when we do this, we use what's called direct current. So this would be like a battery. It always has a positive and negative end. And this is important because in the electricity that's in your house is what's called alternating current, meaning it's kind of being like recycled. The positive and negative end are switching back and forth um, at like 50 hertz, you know, like uh, many, many times per second. And so we can't use this because the cathode and the anode would be constantly shifting back and forth. So we can only use direct current, um, which is like a battery. It always has a negative end, a negative end and a positive. And just a little before we talk more about electricity, um, just some ways to think about electricity, because I know it's, it's not easy to conceptualize for some people if you're not familiar. When we talk about volts and amperage, um, volts is like basically the power, the force behind the electricity and amperage is how much can get through. So we're thinking about water, you know, amperage would be like the, the, the amount of water that can get through this area. So often with electricity, we'll say it's not the voltage that kills you, it's the amperage. 
right? So if you could get hit by 10,000 volts of electricity, but if it's only at a milliamp, you no know, worries, you know, but you could get killed by a nine volt of, sort of electricity if it was at a high amp. So we'll talk more about that tomorrow. But it's important because when we talk about how do we power these structures, how are we getting electricity to the cathode and the anode? Well, if we're using AC power, the power that's in our house, let's say we have a land-based, you know, we're, we're building a, a bio rock or a mineral accretion device right in front of a resort or a hotel. Well, we can come and we can take their electricity, run it out towards the ocean, and then we have first a step down transformer. So all this does is drops it from our 220 volts down to about six to 10 volts. And we do that basically because we don't want to kill anyone if they were to come around and, and see this cable in the ocean and like, hey, what's this? I'll cut it and bring it in because I'm doing a marine uh, debris cleanup or something, right? So we step it down. Um, and then we can either right there, change it from AC to DC, or we can do that underwater. We have both options. AC travels through lines better. The reason why your house and the power lines running from the, the power station to your house is an AC is because it's much less lot is lost. It's more efficient because once you change it to DC, you're losing a lot of it as it's transmitted through the cable. So we have to do two things with the AC power. We have to step it down from its high voltage and we have to convert it from AC to DC. And then we can put it to the cathode and the anode at you know about six to nine volts and six to eight amps. It depends. This really depends on the size of the structure. Um, now, if we were to use like solar or hydro or wind or any other type of renewable power, that's generally created in DC. So we don't actually have to have a, a transformer to change it from DC to AC, uh, from AC to DC. Um, it's already in that. And so we just have to kind of stabilize it and, and get it to the voltage and amperage that we want it. Um, and then get it right out here. So we can use both, you know, the land-based power that's in AC to do this or solar power, hydroelectric or re other renewable. Basically, um, we have a lot of, of options to do this. And once we get out here, this is low voltage. So we're not, you know, too worried about the amount of electricity that we're using. Um, I, I could go through like the calculations. It's, it ends up being, um, if you know, voltage times amperage equals wattage. And so um, if we were to say, you know, six, it's, this is like 36 to 72 watts of electricity, a normal incandescent light bulb would be like 80 to 100 watts. So powering one of these big structures, this is for the HINFI, which is the largest mineral accretion device in the South China Sea. Leaving that on 24 hours a day is about the equivalent of leaving on, it's less than leaving on one light bulb, one traditional light bulb all day. So the energy usage is quite small. Now, I mentioned that there was many factors that can um, affect the mineral accretion rate of growth and also the different um, types of minerals that are put down, the, the composition of those minerals, whether it's aragonite or brucite or um, calcite. So we can look at those um, factors, um, what, what affects that? Well, the first one, of course, is pH because pH is really the um, factor we're thinking most about with this technology because what we're doing is lowering the pH so much that these alkaline minerals fall out of the water. So if we're working with quite acidic water, then it's gonna be harder to get to that point. If we're working with more alkaline water, then that point is easily obtained. Temperature, um, so we can find mineral accretion devices in the tropics and we can find them in more temperate waters growing oysters. Those are gonna operate at um, different capacities or different efficiencies based on the temperature. The salinity, of course, is also a factor and the total dissolved solids or you know, the composition of the impurities or, or the solids that are dissolved into the water. And if you wanna know more about this, I highly recommend you check out this paper They've been looking at mineral accretion and, and testing its um, properties. So both in this paper, that is more, this is where I was talking about decommissioned oil rigs as well. 
um, but in another paper that this same group did um, that we'll talk about now. So this is the other paper that get, group did. You can look it up, Jara. I'm probably saying that wrong and I, with my stupid American accent as well, but um, I think it's Jara or something, um, but um, from two, 2021. So this is a new paper. And they actually, this bit of mineral here is from our Hinfai site in Thailand. Um, so they tested it. This is low voltage secrete. Remember, that's another name for the mineral accretion, the minerals that accrete. Um, they did low voltage warm water and high voltage in cooler water in the Netherlands. And they compared it to Portland cement. What they found with our structure, the minerals from, from Hinfai, is it was slow growing. It's 80% aragonite. That's what we want. That's the stuff that, that corals are making their skeleton out of. Um, calcite is the same mineral composition, but a different mineral structure. Um, and only 18.9% brucite, that magnesium hydroxide that it's not bad. It's not like we don't want it, but it's, it's much less hard. Um, so we don't want a high composition of it. When we look at the high voltage, if we were to really just try to grow this mineral very quickly, like we have in this, then we find that we get a lot more of the brucite. Um, but this is also cold water. So if you check out um, that paper by Margaritini um, from 2000, that'll have a comparison of different electrical rates and different temperatures. So this is kind of not a, you know, the variables aren't always the same between these two because we changed the electricity and the temperature. But the main conclusion from this was that our minerals from Hin Phi are three times harder than Portland cement. So this is actually stronger than cement, um, which, which is, is really cool, I think, um, because we're creating this solid material without all the negative, you know, the mining and, and, and the, the carbon output that comes from creating cement. All right, so that brings me to the end of today's um, lecture. Just wanna, again, mention, you know, um, a lot of the time when I talk about this, this first lecture that we had, tomorrow we're gonna go through all the details, but today we just kind of go over all the happy, good stuff, like, you know, why is it so great? And, and how, a little bit about how it's used, but mostly about the uses and the fact that it can grow corals three to six times faster and corals can grow in a wider range of environmental conditions and also all of the symbiotic organisms. And I know that when I give this lecture to students, um, at some point when I can see all their faces, um, at some point I can kind of see in everyone's eyes like a little bit of skepticism. And they're like, well, if it's so great, then why don't I see it everywhere? Why am I not seeing this technology everywhere I go diving? And, uh, you know, there must be something to this that you're not telling us because all you've told us is the good stuff. And I don't get why I'm not seeing a lot more of this technology everywhere. And so that's what, you know, we'll talk more about that in the next lecture about, you know, what some of the uh, negative sides of, of doing this um, and some of the barriers that have been in place over time and the reasons why you don't necessarily see uh, mineral accretion devices or, or bio rocks or secrete, what it cement um, all over the world and why you might only be being introduced to this today. So we'll go through more of that next time. Um, but this, and I wanted to give another shout out to Bob. Um, he's the one who, who evolves all of our technology and, and does all the work with Conservation Diver and, and the work that I'm doing um, is all coming from Bob. So another thank you to him. Um, today, we're gonna go into a bit more detail about how it works. Um, we'll talk about the electricity, the chemistry of it, um, and then we'll go through a few of the case studies and I'll touch upon some of the questions that um, I brought up yesterday in terms of, you know, why, why you guys are just hearing about this now and why you don't see it everywhere you go. Now, yesterday I mentioned pH. So I just want to, I know some people it's been a while since uh, they've been in, in chemistry and in school. And also I'm American, so I use some different terms. Um, I know most of the world uses only alkaline. In America, we, we often say basic, um, which is another word, you know, acid and base, we call it basic. 
Um, and so I'll use the two words interchangeably. If you're used to one, just know that you know they're, they're the same. Um, and basically what pH is, is a measurement of the hydrogen ion solution. So we think about H2O, um, you know, the, this, this compound, uh, hydrogen and oxygen together, but actually it can also break apart. So we can get hydrogen ions and we can get hydroxide anions. Um, and when we look at the balance of those is what determines pH. So in the center here, if we have the balance between those the same, there's as many H pluses as there are OH minuses in the solution, then we have a neutral pH of seven. So pure water has a pH of seven. If we were to alter that water in some way, we were to um, remove some of these H pluses by reacting them with a base or an alkaline mineral, then we're gonna to start to have more OHs than we have H minuses, which means that we're gonna move down the scale this way. So this is an alkaline state. If the opposite occurred where we started to lose OHs, we started to gain hydrogen ions from some the addition of acid or, or the removal of some alkaline minerals, then we would see that it would start to move to the left here and become more acidic. So generally you can think of these hydrogen ions here as being um, the acid in the water, right? Just to make it kind of easy to think about. So when we talk about electrolysis, really what we're doing is messing with the, uh, the, the, e the equilibrium between hydroxyl ions and the hydrogen anions. Um, so we can look at these half reactions here as what's going on at the cathode and the anode. So when we look at the cathode here, right, this is where we're going to grow our corals and where the, struct the main structure is going to be, where our minerals are going to accrete. And the reason the minerals accrete there is we start off with water and we're going to add electrons. So we add electrons to it. That breaks apart the water to form two of this diatomic molecule, hydrogen gas, right? Like oxygen and, and, and some other uh, gases and other, other uh, elements. Um, it usually tries to find another H like chlorine, like oxygen to find a second molecule. So it's a diato what we call a diatomic molecule. So that becomes hydrogen gas that bubbles out of the water. And then we're left with four OHs. And remember in the last slide, we talked about OHs are what makes water or a solution alkaline. So what's happening at the cathode is that we're pushing electrons into the solution, into the seawater. And in turn, we are removing H, the hydrogen anions, and we're creating this hydroxyl group. And this hydroxyl group is what's gonna react with, those we'll see soon with like our calcium, our calcium and magnesium in the water. All right, so let's look at what's going on then in this half reaction over here at the anode. At the anode, remember, we're pulling electrons out of the water, out of the solution. So we move this, to, we can't do a, in chemistry, we never have a minus. So we just move these over to the other side. So it's H2O minus four electrons. But again, we balance the equation by putting four electrons over here. Breaks apart. And this time we get oxygen gas forming. Right, and that comes bubbling out of the water. And we're left over with, by removing O, we're left with H here. So we leave these four hydroxyl, uh, these four um, hydrogen anions in the water. That's where our acidic, the acidity um, comes from. So at the anode, we're gonna see a very high acidity, right? And we're also, um, we'll, eventually we'll show you, we're gonna see chlorine gas as well. So this is not, conducive to the growth of corals and other organisms. So we can combine those two half reactions to kind of see what happens here. Um, we start off with, you know, six molecules of H2O, sorry, of water, and we're going to break it apart such as, all right, when we do that, you know, to kind of just simplify, this is an unbalanced equation just to kind of make it all look simpler. Um, and basically, once we leave behind these OH minus group, this hydroxyl ion, it will combine with the CO3 in the water and we will end up with our carbonate salts. So this is one of the reasons, because we create a super alkaline environment here, 
we're going to get the deposition of our minerals onto that cathode structure. And it takes, you know, we have to raise the pH to about 9, 9.1 in order for this to occur, to start getting these minerals precipitating out of the water. So remember yesterday we showed a graph of seawater. Seawater is generally like 8 to 8.3 um, pH. So we're raising it up to one more, you know, higher state. Um, if we go above 9.3, then we're going to start to get the magnesium um, carbonate or the, what we call the brucite forming. All right, so now I just want to talk a little bit, um, not really changing gears, but just kind of stepping sideways a little bit and go back to what we talked about yesterday, which was um, with the ocean acidification and what occurs when we put CO2 into seawater or into water in general. And yesterday we mentioned that when we put CO2 and we add it to water, um, some of it is gonna stay as little bubbles of CO2 and just be floating around in the water, dissolved in the water. Um, but some of that can form what we call carbonic acid. And the carbonic acid is an acid because it has a propensity to release these hydrogens off of it. So what we'll see is that the H2CO3 or carbonic acid can easily lose these H pluses, they react with other things to form what we call bicarbonate. And so bicarbonate is um, kind of where a lot of the carbon in the ocean, the state that it's in. Um, so if we just look at the C here, you know, the carbon um, element, atom, um, it, this is the way that carbon exists in the ocean a lot because it can go both ways. It can gain a hydrogen and become um, carbonic acid, or it can again lose one of those hydrogens and become carbonate, CO3. So, so this is kind of a chain reaction, and we have it going from top to bottom, but we could also have see how CO3, carbonate, could become carbon dioxide. CO3 is going to be like a generally a solid, whereas this is a gas. Right? All right, so let's put, we can actually, because, you know, we have carbonic acid here and here, and we have bicarbonate here and here, we can actually combine all these together. So we have this chain that we can see here. This chain is basically what we refer to as the buffering effect of water. So when we have water, it wants to maintain its pH. So if we were to start, we have, you know, we're going to start with uh, mostly a neutral. Most of our carbon is going to be locked up here as bicarbonate. If we start to add an acid, we're going to lose the things on this end and start to push towards this side. And if you've ever done this, uh, maybe you remember from chemistry class where you use phenolphthalein, which is a dye that changes color when you go over certain pH thresholds. And if you've ever worked with that, it can be <laughs> incredibly um, nerve wracking because you add it dropwise, you're like drop, 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 and nothing is happening. Nothing's happening. And you added like your 120th drop, you're counting them out, you're titrating, and still nothing is happening. And you're just like, oh, this is taking forever. And you add two drops, your 120th one and second drop, and it just goes a completely dark color and you realize you've overshot the mark. And this is a kind of thing because pH is in logarithmic scale. So each time we go up a scale, we're going up in order of magnitude. But the, the buffering effect of water, why that, that phenolphthalein doesn't just suddenly change color at drop number 150 is because of this. It doesn't move to a new pH state until all of this is gone. So if we were to have water and we were to you know, add more acid, we would start to lose everything on this side. So when we add acid to water, we lose eventually all the carbonate. And then we end up with only bicarbonate and CO2. If we were to continue pushing this way, we would lose all the bicarbonate as well. And we would end up with so much CO2 in the water that it would be super saturated and just come bubbling out. And we can see this in our daily lives. And if we drink soda or, you know, any type of carbonated beverage, there's literally so much CO2 in there that it's just bubbling out of the water. It's super saturated and it's acidic, which is why your dentist will tell you that it'll rot your teeth, right? It's acidic, we know that. Um, and we can look at like a Coca-Cola and we can see that they add an acid to it. 
now what we can also go the other way you know we started adding limestone or some hydroxyl groups and things we could lose everything on this side and we could start to push further and further this way till we got to a point where you know co3 the carbonate was super saturated and it would start to fall out and if that occurred it would fall out as a it would precipitate out as a solid rather than a gas as we saw on this side so let's let's look at this a bit graphically if, if equations aren't really your thing which i know they're not for a lot of people um, we can kind of see this graphically so this on the bottom we have a scale of ph and then on the side we have you can just think of it as an abundance of the ions of how carbon is in the water so let's look here in the center we have normally and remember we said a ph of 8 to 8.3 so somewhere in here at those states, we have very little carbon dioxide, free carbon dioxide in the water, dissolved in the water. We have quite a bit of carbonate and we're pretty much super saturated with bicarbonate. Um, we, we pretty much can't go any higher. So yesterday we talked about ocean acidification and climate change where we're adding CO2 into the water. We're warming the water up we're increasing the partial pressure of CO2 in the atmosphere. And so we're just increasing this abundance. So as this graph goes, starts to go up, as we add carbon dioxide, what else happens? Well, first off, as we go up, we're also moving to the left. So we're moving down in our pH. As we move to the left, the carbonate, right here, this CO3, remember CaCO3 is what the corals make their skeleton out of? This starts to go down until eventually we just don't even have more in the water. This is when our phenolphthalein would go purple. And also the bicarbonate at some, at some point will start to go down. And once we get to about the pH of Coca-Cola here, then we're super saturated with CO2. It can't hold anymore and it just comes bubbling out of the water. So that's what you know anthropogenic effects are doing to our oceans. Well, what can we do with the bio rock? How can the bio rock or the mineral accretion technology start to push this in the opposite direction? Right. So if we're if we're creating more alkaline environments, we're pushing that ecosystem to the right. We're eating up at some point, we're going to eat up all the CO2. Remember that CO2 is what's reacting as an acid in the water through carbonic acid to deteriorate the CO3 that we have. These two are inversely related, right? So once that goes down, well, this is going up and we end up with so much CO3 that eventually it's just falling out of the water, right? And that's when we start to get our mineral accretion because CO3, it's got this negative two here it really wants to find something that's a plus two. And that would be calcium or other, other positively charged minerals. So as we've seen then how this reaction occurs, both in terms of the equations and now as you know, kind of a graph here. And I just wanna go through one more way of demonstrating it. Um, hopefully that we can get all the different learning styles understanding it. Um, and now I wanna look at, instead of looking at water, let's look at some of the other minerals that are in the water. Because this reaction, if we were just doing this in um, pure water, it, it wouldn't really work um, because the electrons don't really flow through the water very well. So normally we use like a saline solution. I mentioned how, you know, in, um, in Singapore, they're, they're using the waste brine, the super um, concentrated brine from the desalination plants to get minerals. So we need minerals in the water. Uh, minerals are much better at transferring electrons than just the water, pure water itself. So let's look at the simplest uh, mineral reaction that we have in the electrolytic cell or in our um, electrolysis. And this is the breakdown of sodium chloride or what we call table salt. So you know that water um, or like water, that the salt is pretty stable compound, right? If you have salt in your cabinet, you can leave it there unrefrigerated for longer than you'll live and it'll still be salt. 
we can mine ancient salts from the Himalayas that form before the uprise of those mountains, right? The uplift. So salt, salt is a very stable molecule, but we can break it apart using electrolysis into sodium and chlorine. Remember, this is a diatomic molecule, so it always exists as two of them. And so this is actually how we would produce chlorine gas or pure sodium by breaking apart salt. And we do this, it doesn't want to do that, but we can force it to do that through electrolysis. So we're going to add the oxidation numbers on here, just so everyone can see what we're, what we're looking at. And if it's been a while since you've been in chemistry, we get the oxidation numbers from the periodic table of elements. So we find that Na here is in column one. So it always has a plus one up here. And chlorine is going to be a negative one over here. So we can add these oxidation numbers, positive one, negative one. And in these states, the diatomic molecule and everything is balanced at zero. All right, so how do we get this to occur? Well, we have to do what are called oxidation and reduction reactions by pushing or pulling electrons from this system here, right? So in reduction, Reduction means that we gain an electron. I know that sounds a little bit opposite, but we're reducing the charge by adding a negatively charged electron. So reduction, we add an electron. And oxidation, we move, remove an electron. If, you're not, if you don't like those types of graphs, then you can watch my janky uh, animation here, and I'll demonstrate this. So, Remember, we have first off with electrolysis, we've got this electron. And the electrons being uh, going from our power source through our electrodes, the cathode, and it's pushing, the cathode is pushing the electron into the water. And then the anode is pulling that electron out of the water and returning it back to its power source. And as we do this, we don't just have pure water, we have this kind of electrolytic cell where we have these sodium chloride right here, or the salt, right? Now, when we've got these electrons going through here, the electrons are going to attract these positively charged um, atoms, and they're going to repel these negatively charged ones, and the opposite thing's going to happen at the anode. So we'll see that sodium is attracted over towards the cathode. When it is over here, it's going to get be given an electron, right? So that electron is going to go to sodium and then sodium loses that positive charge. All right, as that occurs, that electron comes out over and it's pulled out of the water over here, giving this a positive charge. So that, in turn, will attract that chloride over there, which is going to take an electron from that chloride, a chlorine atom, and then pull it out, right? And so we're going to, that reaction is going to keep happening. Those chlorines, they don't like to exist as individually, so they're going to link up to become chlorine gas, Cl2, which is then going to go bubbling out of the water. Over here, We've got the Na plus. It's going to continue to react. And we can see the equation here of what we just saw, the half reactions here. So we get the two chlor chlorine atoms. They combine to, chlor to form chlorine gas, plus two electrons are removed. Over here, we add an electron to the positively charged sodium atom to neutralize it. So in the end, the electricity allows us to create this reaction. So we could actually, no, we're not going to do it, but we could actually go through, and this is from um, Professor Hilbert's uh, patent that, that I mentioned yesterday, and we could actually go through and see how every one of the, the different atoms or, or minerals in seawater would react this way. We could see how, you know, calcium with these two pluses would combine with the CO3 in the water to form calcium carbonate. Remember, that's our aragonite, our calcite, depending on its mineral structure. This is, this is basically what the corals are making their skeletons out of. This is limestone 
as we know it on terrestrial environments. Um, we could look at how magnesium is another major one. Magnesium is going to bond with the two of the hydroxide, hydroxyl ions to form magnesium hydroxide, which we call brucite. Remember, we also get that hydrogen gas bubbling out from each of these equations. So we could kind of go through all these in the same way that we just went through sodium chloride, but um, we do that normally in, in, the, in the full course, but we're not gonna do that today. Um, but just to reiterate, so we start to get our reduction in our alkaline um, compounds over here and our oxidation or our acidic compounds over on this side, like our chlorine gas that goes bubbling out of the water. So this is all the chemistry behind the mineral accretion devices. Um, this is, you know, if you wanted to calculate, you know, where these different molecules are going, what's the output of CO2, all that kind of stuff, you could gain it from these reactions. Um, again, so we have a lot of elements in water. Um, this is, you know, kind of most abundant are sodium, magnesium, and calcium. We also have like potassium, strontium. Um, and we could go down this list, you know, including gold and uranium and all these very rare earth um, elements that are also quite valuable um, are all in the water. And depending on how, we, you know, our temperature and the electrical charge that we're putting through and the pH and then the salinity and all this, we could get different minerals to come out of the water. Um, and so it's not just the, um, out, the electrical potential changes of quite a few things. So it changes the concentration gradients of these minerals. It attracts them. Remember, as we saw with those electrons, the, the negatively charged electron attracted the positively charged sodium. So that's ionic attraction. And then we also have electric migration. So these are the three ways that these cathode and anodes move these different elements, these different minerals through the water. And just to reiterate, um, and yesterday I kind of mentioned, you know, that um, we don't necessarily, a lot of times people think, well, this is, you know, you're taking CO2 in that equation that you showed, you're taking CO2 and you're turning it into CO3, um, which is a solid. So you're basically taking CO2 gas and turning it into a solid like limestone. So isn't this a, a form of carbon sequestration? Um, unfortunately, no, it's not. Um, limestone creation is actually the second or third largest natural source of carbon dioxide. And the reason for that is that we're combining this calcium with the bicarbonate. And when we do that in that reaction, we get the formation of limestone plus water, but we also get this CO2 here. So for every molecule of this we create, we're creating one molecule of this. So that's why the deposition of limestone actually contributes to the global carbon um, budget. Now, when we create brucite, the, there is some, uh, I, I'm not very well versed in it, but um, there is a way that you can create brucite and as brucite changes, it does sequester carbon dioxide, but I'm not too versed, well versed in that, um, but something that someone wants to look into. So we're not actually sequestering carbon in this. And uh, corals don't actually sequester carbon when they grow either because of this exact reaction. Um, a lot of people, like for a long time, I believe this as well. I was like, you know, like everyone says plant a tree, but trees only live for 80 years before they give their carbon back into the cycle. So I thought it would always, why won't people say plant corals? Because it seemed to me that corals would sequester that carbon in a much more stable form. Um, but in fact, this about energy balance, the, the budget doesn't work out. So how are corals doing this? Well, corals are doing this very similar to the reactions that we just looked at. So they're taking in like the bicarbonate and the CO2. Um, they're taking that CO2. They're using their own metabolic energy, that energy that they, they get from their zooxanthellae to strip away some of these hydrogen ions and create within the the area between their tissue and the existing skeleton, they create this extremely alkaline state. So they're going above 9.3 in pH here. And then that causes the calcium that's normally in the water to combine with that carbonate and form CaCO3, our, our 
limestone, right? So this is how the corals are actually making their, their skeletons, is by utilizing the bicarbonate in the water to create this. And um, so we're basically helping them out. And we talked a bit about this yesterday, right? So what we're really doing with this mineral accretion in the, in the sense of using it for corals is we are decreasing the amount of energy required to do this calcification reaction that we just talked about. And that frees up more of their metabolic energy to go towards reproduction and reserves. Reserves allows them to better survive uh, during times of hardships. So when we have, um, you know, coral bleaching and disease outbreaks, sedimentation, declining water quality, all that kind of stuff, they got more energy to weather that storm. They also have higher reproduction rates, which means more seeds for the future reefs, right? So when we lose coral, we got to replace them. And this is what does that. This also creates a new generation, which may be more or less well adapted to changing conditions. So they may be able to survive in the conditions that their parents were not able to. So now I want to go into a little bit of case studies and talk about <clears throat> some of the projects I've been involved with. And this will also lead us into a little bit of the other side of it. Um, so we've talked about the science side. We've talked about you know, how it can be used, the benefits. And at closing of yesterday's lecture, I talked a little bit about the fact that I very often encounter people giving me a very skeptical eye at some point or another during these lectures, because I'm sitting here telling them how great it is. And they're sitting there wondering, well, if it's so great, why isn't it everywhere? Why don't I see this everywhere I go? Why haven't I dived on one of these? Why, why don't I see these on TV and everywhere else if it's such a great thing and it can grow corals three to six times faster and it can provide this sort of metaphorical coral arc for them to survive these bleaching events and, and they can reverse ocean acidification. This sounds too good to be true. And I'll get into that a little bit. So let's look, um, we'll hold our expectations a bit on how great it is. So I want to talk about my experience with, um, with what we call BioRock. BioRock is a patented and trademark name. Um, so we know that on Wolf Hilbert's original patent, it was mineral accretion, right? And we see these terms like electro deposition. Um, and then in um, what was it, 1996, then we had come out with the term BioRock. So I'm going to, I'm using the two interchangeably, but when I do refer to BioRock, I am kind of re referring to that trademark name um, or the company that, that manages it. So we, I, I worked with a very small pilot project, BioRock in, in Aota Cha, that was just incredible. And it was, you could spend all day there. Um, it was so beautiful and it, you didn't need any science. You didn't need to collect any data. You just put your head in the water and underneath you is beautiful corals and to the left and right, everything's dead as far as you can see. So we did our first project when I was the head of Save Kotao, which is the local community group. I was the head of the head of their marine branch. So when we had, they said, well, we decided we we're gonna do one big project to kind of kick off the start of this community group. And we got 18 dive schools to start raising money. And we wanted to build this alternative dive site because Koh Tao is a 19 square kilometer island. And at the time had 42 dive schools, which we thought was insane um, that there could be that many dive schools on such a small island. Um, to put that in perspective, today there's, well, before COVID, there was about 76 dive schools. So what we thought was insane wasn't even half of what we could have. Um, so anyways, we wanted to get, we saw that the divers were having a major impact on the reefs, and you can um, read papers about that if you, if you want. Um, but they were, we wanted to create an alternative dive site. We basically wanted to get people off of the, the most heavily dived areas and allow them to recover a bit and create this alternative site. So we found there was this big pinnacle here um, that nobody knew about because nobody dove here. It was in the middle of like a channel. And we decided we could put this big structure here and it would create an area that you could easily spend an hour diving in. We also put like a control dome off of here 
um, so that we could test, have a, a, a good you know, control to evaluate if, how fast the corals are growing on this electrified site and how fast they're growing on the non-electrified site, which are, is in the same area undergoing the same conditions. So this was the project that we, we designed um, alongside the BioRock company. In terms of bringing community together, it was highly successful. It was one of the most successful projects that we had the entire time that I, I was running this group. When we built this, we built it on the beach over the course of a month and we had everybody coming by. We had the dive schools that were helping out, the 18 dive schools that were raising money and, and, and helping us to build. Um, but we would have people like, like you know, Thai people and elderly people that were walking to the temple and they'd be like, what are all these Westerners doing on the beach, like building stuff? And they'd just come over and ask us and we'd explain and they'd be like, oh, well, I got 30 minutes. Like, I'll, I'll, I'll help you out. And, and other people would be like, oh, really? Well, I'm on my way to, to, to work, but, you know, I'll be done with work in two hours. I'll come back. So we had the whole community helping us making this stuff. It was beautiful. Um, when we did this, this is the ceremony. Um, and if you can, you can watch, there's a if you search Hin Phi on YouTube. You can see the whole video of this and everything. But we had the school kids come out. We had the monks come out and bless it. We had the elders and, and you know, all the influential people on the island. Everybody was a part of this project. So in terms of community, it was perfect. It, it couldn't have been better. Um, and it, all the money was raised in the community. So like we were, we were so happy. It, it was a huge success up to this point. We got it in the water, you know, all on our own. We just attached a bunch of floats onto these big domes and everything and dragged them out by boat. Um, we didn't require any major equipment. We didn't have to hire any big companies to come in with barges and cranes. It, it, was, it was a great community work. And, and at this point in, in the project, I thought we're gonna do this every year. This is, this is, you know, this is incredible. There was no bad taste, nothing. So where did the money, now I'm gonna go into, we're gonna leave the science, the happy science side and ecology side of everything and go into the business side of things, unfortunately. So let's look at where this money came from. So we raised a million bot, which is about $30,000. Um, we got most of that was raised by the local dive schools. So we were doing like bar nights, like quiz nights. We were having fundraisers and, and everybody was donating and everybody was working hard from the dive schools. We got money from Save Totau, a bit from this defunct community group that, that existed about five, six years earlier. Um, Project Aware gave us a bit, some of the local businesses and SSI donated. So we raised um, nearly a million baht, which is, is what the BioRock company led by Thomas Garreau told us that we would need for this project. So he came in and um, then gave us the invoices that we needed to pay. So the first one was a BioRock licensing fee. Um, this fee was the largest part of the project. So most of our money, the largest percentage, went for this BioRock licensing fee that, that you know, we were happy to pay because Dr. Garreau told us that this money was going to go to Wolf Hilbert's family. And that Wolf Hilbert's had passed away, um, unfortunately in 2007, and this project was in 2008. So I was never able to work with him or meet him, although I, I would have really loved to, um, based on everything I've read. I, I love reading his stuff. So this fee, um, we later found out, did not make it to Wolf Hilbert's family. Then we had the anode metal. The anodes that or that are used by BioRock is a titanium platinum alloy, which um, back in the you know, 1980s and 90s was state of the art. Um, it was not so state of the art by the time we got it. Um, and that was very expensive. It had to be shipped in from out of the country. Um, we, we were not involved in that. We just paid the invoice. The materials, this I don't mind paying. This was like steel and stuff that we bought on the island or in Thailand. So we raised money from the community and, and this is money that went back to the community right here. Um, the Bulbs Transformer is the BioRock on location power supply. So this is basically the, the power transformer that we'll get into in another moment, but that was a pretty big expense. Flights and expenses for Dr. Garreau and Thomas Sarkeesian. Um, this is you know kind of you know what we had to pay to get them there. 
um, and then the BioRock consulting fees. You know, I, I, I tr they have like 30 years of experience in this. And so they definitely deserve to be paid for that. However, I expected a lot more assistance. Um, we designed it, we, we basically did everything. Um, and they kind of cheerleaded us on the whole way. But they did, they did do the bulbs transformer and we didn't know what we needed for anode material. Um, but we had to find the site. We had to talk with the, the, the owner of the land to get the electricity. We had to design the actual, you know, what we were gonna build underwater. So I, I am not, you know, not putting this down, but I don't really feel good about this too much. I was expecting a lot more help. Um, labor, I, I, I'm happy to pay 20 times more for labor because this was uh, people, this was the people welding. And so this was local community members on, on our island. So I'm happy to give money to them. Printing and marketing, I think we did pretty good to raise a million baht and only spend 10,000 baht. Um, and then tools, you can't do anything without tools. So as you can see, this is going to be a barrier for a lot of communities. Because if you're raising money in your community in a, you know, what many would call a third world country in a remote tropical island where people make, you know, somewhere around five to eight dollars a day uh, in a good job. Um, this is a lot of money and none of it, hardly any of it really went back into the community. Whereas in the projects that we did in years subsequent, everything, we didn't pay anyone off of the island. Every, all, everything that we bought was bought on the island. Everything that was built was built by people on the island. So this is, is one major issue I see with it. The other thing that's a major problem is that, you know, the BioRock company has been doing this in many areas for a very extended period of time. They at no point told us that we would need to set aside money for maintenance. However, we're working with electricity and water. If you build a bio, if you build a mineral accretion device, you better expect to be doing some maintenance on it. Um, we've learned subsequently, it's very hard to get it to run, you know, constantly for a couple of years. Even a year is, is, is great. I mean, we've had our units, we get them cut, you know, the cable gets cut, the electricity, something happens with the transformer, um, they get hit by lightning, like you need to put money aside for maintenance. But there was no mention to our community that we needed to put money aside. Um, so when it broke uh, two years, not even two years later, it stopped working and there was no money set aside to fix it. Um, and when we asked Dr. I mean, sorry, Thomas Sarkeesian to come up to fix it, he was on an island two hours away by boat. Uh, if you've ever been to this area, he was on Koh Samui. And he wanted $10,000 US dollars to come and look at it. And that's just to look at it. That's not to fix it. Once he found out what the problem was, then he would fix it. Um, so that was the end of our you know, kind of relationship with them. Um, I could go on all day. But, but let's look at, you know, kind of what, what did we get for this money? So this is the BOLPS unit, the BioRock on location power supply. So the electricity comes from the island. Remember, we had 220 volt AC power. And we step it down to, a, to about 10 volts to send it out here. So this is 10 volt AC power, comes into this metal box. And then there's a transformer in here that's going to turn it into DC power in about two to three volts. And then the cable comes out and goes to the cathodes, which is the four domes and those wavy bits in between. And then these cables come out and go to the anodes. The anode looks pretty high tech here, but all we did was take the, it's, it's like chicken wire, a titanium platinum alloy. And we just rolled it up and shoved it in this tube so that, um, you know, it wouldn't get broken or destroyed or beat up or stolen or, or something else. Um, it doesn't look very fancy in here. I don't think anyone who's going to steal it is going to be scuba diving down to um, eight meters where this is at. But, you know. um, but this is where I mentioned, like, we had it shut off for a while. When it was shut off for a while, a lot of little fishes went inside here. And then we turned it back on. Uh, unfortunately, the chlorine gas. Uh, eliminated a few of those fishes. We found them, you know, halfway out dead, unfortunately. Um, so this is pretty simple, you know, like, like I showed you yesterday, 
that little video clip of, of just doing this in a beaker where you we had a titanium bolt and a piece of metal steel and we put them in, in a glass a beaker of seawater and, and did this um, and this is exactly that but on a bigger scale so this is our titanium bolt from that video and, and this is that piece of metal basically um, so our minerals are going to create here our corals are going to grow here and this is not going to be for anything so the bulb screen is what I want to focus on um, so this was in 2008. Now we can't see what's inside this bulbs unit. Um, we can't see if it's running. We can't see if it's full of water. We don't know anything about it. Um, it's, a, it's a black box. And anything that we asked about it during the assembly, during this project setup, we were told that it was proprietary information that we were not privy to. So we literally knew nothing about it. When it stopped working, I mentioned that, you know, we, we were done working with the BioRock company at that point, and we weren't going to pay $10,000 for someone to take a two hour boat ride to us. And so we just left it for a few years until um, I mentioned my friend Bob from who started Coral Aid. He came and did my course. And so we decided we were going to change this bulb unit out and figure out what's broken. So we, we brought it up and we opened it up. And lo and behold, inside is a variable amperage battery charger. So you can pick one of these up for $500, probably about 200 in Thailand. And we, they just made this big metal pill case and shoved this in there. Um, this is, you know, literally the cables that come out of it, it just go in and to the four anodes and one cable in. So this is what cost 150,000 baht. And this is like 1960s, 1970s technology. This is exactly what Wolf, Professor Hilberts was using. Um, you know, they, they, in, in between what Wolf Hilberts was doing in the 1970s and 80s to 2008, this is how far the technology had come. I uh, would not say it's come very far <laughs> in my opinion. I don't know if you guys agree with me, but I think we could do better. And so we did. So we took this big bulbs unit that is an obscure case that we can't see into. We have no idea what's going on here. It could be working, it could be on fire, it could be flooded, we have no idea. And these big ugly anodes that nobody wants to dive around. Um, and we changed it to this. So we retrofitted the Hinfi site with these anodes, this is a mixed metal oxide, rather than a huge spool of chicken wire, we can get the same reaction to occur from this small amount of material that we can buy on eBay. So this is mixed metal oxide coated. Um, these are also referred to, I think sometimes as DNSA anodes. Um, we also have here a controller. If you can see this, this says coralade.com. So if anyone came and dove here and they're like, what's going on? What's all these cables? What's all, you know, they could just, oh, I'll go to correlate.com after my dive and I'll know everything, right? Um, it's got the amperage. And so this is the voltage and the amperage here that's being pumped out. Um, this is the first kind of generation uh, of the, the materials that we bought. So we replaced all this big bulky equipment. But I shouldn't say we, uh, I did the work, underwater work, but Bob, he made all this. Um, he gets all the credit for that for sure. Um, all this became this. Is and He did this in about six months. Um, he just was like, ah, what you told me in your lecture wasn't entirely true. I'm going to go home and I'll come back with something better. And he was true to his word. But he didn't stop there. He keeps creating more of these. Um, so this is the fourth generation one. This can power four anodes. Um, this one is variable, so it has magnetic switches. So when it's on, you'll see on the screen here, um, but we can actually take a magnet uh, here, sorry, take a magnet here to these points and we can change the voltage and amperage from underwater. So we can be there on our dive and we can be like, huh, it's kind of underpowered at the moment, let's turn it up a bit. And while underwater, we can do that. We don't have to bring it out of the water to check it. It's got numbers on it that tells us how it's doing. With this fourth generation, I can actually check this, what's going on underwater from anywhere in the world from my phone. 
So Bob's also created an app. So that app allows us to know what the temperature is, what, what's going on with the voltage and amperage. Has it been hit by lightning? Is it not working? When did it go down? You know, like with the Volps unit, we just had to dive and be like, huh, there's no bubbles today. Are we sure there's no bubbles or just because the water current's strong and we can't really see the bubbles? Are there just the bubbles small? We have to make educated guesses. This one, there's no educated guesses. We know that it got hit by lightning on April 4th at 2.30 in the afternoon. And we know that it's out now and all that kind of stuff. So this is what Bob did. He's been working less than a few years, um, whereas you know, Dr. Garo had this technology for decades. He's also experimented with many different anode types and setups. Um, this is over here is for a solar unit that we installed on the island. So if you have solar, you don't need all that bulky transformers. All you need is kind of like a voltage stabilizer um, conditioner. So we hook up uh, a solar panel to this. All the circuitry is inside the PVC here, the, the anodes right here. So this just floats above our artificial reef to create the um, electrolysis, the mineral accretion device. So pretty simple. And um, we just use like a sol floating solar panel. Um, this one's on the water. The idea with that was that um, if birds pooped on it, <laughs> it would clean off, it would self be self-cleaning. Um, it did end up getting hit by a boat though, even with this um, yellow ball here. So we, what, we, what we're doing now, what Bob's doing now, he's working with um, Reef Watch India, which is a, a good friend of ours. And they're building like floating solar platforms, you know, much, much larger. It's still one solar panel, but it's a big platform so that it won't get hit by boats, but they do have the problem with like birds pooping on it and stuff. So, so yeah, I mean, we're just trying to evolve the technology and you can see that the solar panel on, on this day, it was putting out 2.8 volts and about 0.2 amps um, with, you know, this little anode here and the, the solar panel, as I said, the structure's just down below. So from this, we decided, you know, let, let's do this on a big scale here. So um, my, my old business partner has a resort here and we have this great area here in, in what's called Owlook on Kotao, where we've been working since 2007 to create a bunch of artificial reefs in this area, but haven't been that successful because the, the water quality here is not that good. Um, so when we put down reefs here, they take a very long time to grow. And so we decided let's, let's set up some, some of our mineral accretion like experimental area here. And we've got electricity, we've got a road here, it's easy to access, we have staff that can watch it. We built this huge donut structure that you can see here. I, this was in 2015. And in the center, there's like this seahorse structure. Um, you can see some of the cables here. And um, these blue tags were just part of our monitoring system. So we're able to, to tag some corals and monitor their growth very closely. And well, here's an updated picture. So this is from 2000, late 2000, mid 2016, I think this is. And you can see all these corals on here. And um, I think Anthony had asked yesterday about uh, massive corals. And you can see these parieties here, just looking incredible, I think. Um, the branching corals, you know, you can see we've got soft corals on here. Somewhere there's a giant clam. It's just doing incredibly well um, with this technology. So we're using this as kind of a research site. Um, another thing, I don't want to get too much into it, but another problem, sorry to go back, another problem with um, the BioRock company as it is, is a lot of people have trouble contacting them and being able to do research. I, I'm in touch with several students and I had one student, um, you know, we actually, she did her, her work on the HIN5 site and while she was writing her paper, we actually wrote to Dr. Garo and said, hey, look, you know, we're doing this work. We're comparing the growth of corals on the electrified dome to the non-electrified dome, and we're using computer software to do so. 
And um, do you want to be part of this? And, and do you want to be an advisor and get your name on this paper? He said, yes. Um, and then, you know, didn't really help. Um, he, he did answer a couple of emails, but then she published her paper with only her name on it about two years later. And then I started getting all these emails about how I was going around him and, and, and taking his credit and stealing his work and, and all this stuff. And he seemed to have no recollection that we'd ever asked. And I've heard similar things from other people. So when you look into the literature, you're going to find that all of the literature about this technology and, and growing corals has Dr. Gros' name on it, which for the scientific community is, you know, if, if you read about a new drug from Pfizer that was incredibly, it, it cured everything, and the person who wrote it was the president of Pfizer, you're not going to really put much faith in that, that scientific work. And that's kind of the problem that the scientific community has at the moment is that they want to invest, do some research on this, but Dr. Garo seems to undermine that research and, and always, you know, prevent it. So the research isn't getting done and then the scientific community can't accept this. And so, you know, even if you try to bring it up in, in scientific conferences, no one wants to talk about it. So what we're trying to do is, is, is start a new kind of ethos within this industry and remove all these barriers. Um, this is technology that's been around for a long time. And, um, you know, I, I've heard that Wolf Hilberts would really want it to be shared to, to, for people to be using it. And unfortunately, that's not happening. So we're trying to change the culture around this technology. And um, so we're, we're doing some research. We've set up these um, pyramids that I'll go into more, but we're looking at coral, how do corals grow? Is it true that they grow three to six times faster? Because I, I believe it, I've seen it, um, but the only papers that say it have Garo's name on it and he holds a patent for it. So no one wants to listen to that. So we've got to prove it independently that it does help, that it does allow corals to grow faster, that it does allow them to grow in a wider range of environmental conditions. We want to look at the current density. How do we optimize it? What, how much current do we really need? Um, you can't go into the papers and find, you know, from, from Dr. Garo's publications, like, okay, if you have a structure this size, this is how much electricity you should be using. There's no, there's no charts, there's no publicly available information like that, where somebody in a, you know, a local community could go and investigate and know, okay, this is how I calculate current density on my structure. Um, we want to know what are the effects of intermittent power? Does it have to be powered on all the time or is it a good idea to, to turn it off sometimes? When that mineral is growing, when the, the mineral is accreting on there, coral larvae aren't really going to be successful on there, right? Because if a coral larvae settles on it, it's going to be outgrown by those minerals in its early life stage. Um, in later life stages, no problem, but in the early life stage. So what about if we allow the minerals to accrete and then shut it off for like two years? and then allow those polyps, those juveniles to settle on it and then um, turn it back on and allow them to thrive. What are the long-term effects? Is it going to, de if corals are growing faster, does it decrease the density of their skeletons? Um, how is it working? You know, I, I talk about the, the decreased alkalinity, I mean, the increased alkalinity and the, you know, pushing it in the opposite way that climate change and, and ocean acidification are pushing oceans. But Dr. Garo has articles talking about electromagnetic fields um, and these types of things. We also saw, you know, we can talk about the input of electrons and, and this kind of stuff. So we don't have quantification of the benefits. Maybe all three are correct in, in you know, different degrees. We don't know. Um, we had a question about fouling and, and microbial communities. How does it affect the sponges and tunicates and the macroalgae? and the things that we don't want growing in coral reef areas. And also, what are the socioeconomic or cost-benefit analysis? If we look at the coral restoration world, a lot of the criticisms that we get is, you guys are putting in too much work for the benefit. You know, if you're paying $100 to grow a coral, you know, and, and, and what are the benefits that a coral gives in terms of economic benefits? Is this really, are you getting a, a return on your investment? Um, so we have to know about that and the socioeconomic benefits that we go to 
hotels and resorts and governments and we're trying to say that they should do this, um, we need to provide it to them in, in, in monetary and financial terms that they're used to speaking in, not in terms of, yeah, it's going to make the reefs better because a lot of people don't care about that, unfortunately. We also want to know about natural recruitment. Uh, most of the bio rock projects that, that I am familiar with in the world, um, it's using, you know, transplants. And so they're taking corals broken like us, corals of opportunity, corals that are lying around in the sand and would die otherwise and rescuing them on these. Um, but what about natural recruitment? Because it would be much nicer just to be able to set one of these up and let it run on its own rather than having to constantly transplant corals. So those are the things we're looking at. Um, we've set up this experimental site there now. Look, so we've got all these pyramids. We put on these different genre of corals on there and we're growing them and measuring them. And we should have this publication soon. As I talked about yesterday, you know, we've been providing samples to other researchers and, you know, just really trying to change the culture around this technology because unfortunately for, for many years now, it's kind of been a very paranoid and secretive community, which is very unfortunate. I mean, some of the people that are doing this work have I've never even spoken with. And um, that's very strange because if you look at like some of the other techniques we use, like coral spawning, coral spawning is a technique that's been around for like less than 10 years to culture and, and use coral larvae in, in restoration. And so it's a very new technology and nobody's trying to patent it. Nobody is keeping it secretive. Nobody's, you know, not telling the dates like, oh, I'm not, I, I found out when this coral spawns, it's at, you know, it's eight o'clock on, on October 30th, but I'm going to keep that information to myself. No, we're, we're publishing, we're, we're making the information available. Um, when people do this, I get emails, I, I know who's doing it in the world. And when it comes to mineral accretion, every time I find out, oh, these people have been doing it for 10 years and I never even talked to them. Like what's going on with this community? Why aren't people sharing information? And I think a lot of that is kind of an artifact from, from what's been going on the last 10 years. So I really hope that we can change the culture around this. And that's you know why we're doing these types of workshops, why we try to just give you all the information we have and everything we know um, and why we are setting up these different groups. So we do with Conservation Diver, um, we normally do a certification course when there's not COVID on doing this. Um, it goes through the background and what with Bob, what we're actually working towards is having these workshops where people walk out of those with their own NetVeo um, transformer, like the ones I showed you. With those transformers, they look highly complex to me because uh, I'm not into circuitry and stuff. Um, but they basically, everything in that little box that I showed, that transformer that's powering Hinfi now and our other sites that Bob has made can be bought for $500 from eBay. So anyone can build them. And what we hope to do is get everyone building them. And so our workshops will be towards that. Um, so I really hope that, you know, once COVID and is over and travel resumes, that some of you guys can get to one of the places where these are in existence and start working with them. And hopefully by that time, we'll have our workshops with actually building them um, as well. I've also set up just recently this um, mineral accretion technologies group on Facebook. You can see it, no one is very small still, um, but we've got, you know, a few people who have been working on this, um, like, you know, masters and PhD candidates or, or others who are working on it. And I just want this to be a place to just openly share and ask information. So I encourage you guys to join if, if this is something you wanna be more involved in. Um, we'll try to, if anyone finds papers, I can post it there, wanna discuss it, ask questions. And hopefully we can make this into a place where, you know, if someone's actually doing this, it can be a place to get like troubleshooting help. Like, you know, hey, I set this up and I built this mineral accretion device to, grow oysters in the, in the harbor where I live in, in Canada, and I'm having a problem. This is the problem I'm having. Does anyone have any advice? That's how I want this to be used. Um, so I, I invite you guys all to, to join up this, to join the discussion, to ask questions, to post things you find around the internet or your own experiences would be even better. 
Uh, again, I just want to say thank you to Correlate and thank you to Bob. I know he's not here today, but he's a wonderful person who is just trying to do good stuff. And I hope that everyone gets a chance to meet him in the future. That's him there attaching that light bulb that I mentioned yesterday. No functional purpose whatsoever, but when you can do cool stuff, why not? Um, so, so yeah, I, I really appreciate all you guys coming to this. I hope that everybody learned something. Um, I hope that you understand more about this technology, more about you know why we need it and how great it is and how it should be used, um, the history of it, and maybe a little bit about kind of bumps in that history that we can now move past and start to smooth out and, and create a better trajectory for the future.